All right, grace and peace, everyone. We are back on Zion's prayer line tonight. This is our evangelism series. We've been um, teaching on evangelism on at the Associate Minister's Night every Thursday during our 40-day fast. So we're now in day 17 of our 40-day fast, and we have been doing evangelism um, since the beginning of that. We started off with Reverend Dorseline Jones, and then last week we had Minister Isaiah McCutcheon, and tonight we have Reverend Barbara Moore. So I'm going to pass it off to Reverend Barbara Moore, um, who will be teaching from Romans chapter 10. Thank you, Reverend Moore. Amen. Thank you, Sister Trace, Minister Trace Elan. Sorry about that. All right. Grace and peace to everybody who's on the line. And I'm not sure if Pastor is here or not, but to him or to him in his absence, I believe there are a couple of meetings slash rehearsal going on at church. So he might very well be involved with one of those. But grace and peace to you, all of you, my sisters and brothers. Um, <clears throat> like Sister <clears throat> Minister Tracy Lynn said, we're talking tonight about um, from Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. And I believe I'm the fourth, um, third or fourth in line to talk about evangelism. And tonight we're talking about um, from those verses, how can they believe if they have not heard? How can they believe if they have not heard. Um, and again, the scripture is Romans 10, 14 through 16. I'm going to be reading from a translation that we don't use very, very often, uh, but a sanctioned, uh, authorized translation nonetheless, the New Living Translation. So if you have that verse and you're able to stand, please go ahead and stand as we reverence the word of God. Amen. Amen. Romans 10, 14 through 16 from the New Living Translation. And it reads this way, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Verse 16. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? The word of the Lord thus far. You may be seated. And let's pray for a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give your name all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. You are the only one who is worthy to receive it. And Father, we thank you for this time that uh, has been set aside for us to learn more about you. We pray that you would speak to us tonight about evangelism in the mighty name of Jesus. Give increase and multiplication to all of the time and preparation that I've spent. We need you to breathe on it, Lord. And we declare hearts to be good ground where your word will take root and grow and bring forth fruit. And the fruit will remain in 30, 60, and even 100 fold measure. This is our prayer tonight in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So I said the title or, or the topic that we're going to be looking at is how can they believe if they have not heard? Um, that's the, the subject title that I was assigned for tonight. As I was looking at the text, I um, had some other um, thoughts, if you will, or a, 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 another thought or one other thought. And I would just sort of uh, subtitle it, they're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. So Paul opens chapter 10 with a statement about his desire for Israel to be saved. Hopefully we have that same ardent feelings about our neighbors, friends, and, uh, uh, and our fellow citizens of today. If we've been transformed by the renewing of our minds and now have the mind of Christ dwelling in us, then we should want what he wants. And the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that he does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We find similar language in Matthew 18, where Jesus gave the parable of the lost sheep where the shepherd leaves the 99 to go search for the one lost sheep. You remember that story. Jesus ended that lesson by saying, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Even in the Old Testament, God said through the prophet Ezekiel, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways 
and live. Presuming then that as believers, we share the Father's and Jesus's passion for the salvation of the lost. Let's, let's dive into our study for this evening. But let's start a few verses above where we read just a minute or two ago and go to verse 13, where Paul says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is an echo um, from the Old Testament prophet Joel um, in verse 232. And it was also quoted by Peter, um, in, in Acts on the day of Pentecost, when he addressed the crowd who thought that they were drunk because they'd be filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in unknown languages. You remember that the 3000 souls were added to the church that particular day in that one instance. Well, that bold confession, uh, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That encouraging statement reminds us of the truth of First John 1, 9 that says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we find that same truth repeated just a couple of verses earlier in our focus chapter here in Romans 10. It's at verse nine and it reads really, really popular or a familiar passage of scripture it reads that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we see through multiple scriptures that everyone who makes a sincere confession receives salvation. Everyone. You talk about inclusion. It's as if Paul was beginning with the end in mind. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He had the end in mind. But the questions that Paul poses in verse 14 introduce a bit of tension to our text, a bit of challenge uh, a bit of pause to the situation. It, it's like he's saying, we know we have a winning solution. If every if everybody calls, then everybody will be saved. But in, in the midst of the winning solution, there's a missing piece or a missing part. It reminded me as I studied it of the pandemic and our supply chain issues. You remember how at times there were cargo ships that were full of goods that arrived in ports, but there was nobody to offload them. Uh, but the store shelves were sometimes empty. There were shortages of chicken in the stores, uh, yet they were being slaughtered in mass at warehouses around the country um, to, to get rid of them because there was no one to actually do the processing. They had the product, but they just couldn't get it to you. Matthew's gospel said the same when he said the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's a problem. We have a supply chain issue. And this is what Paul seems to be saying when he introduces those questions. He said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But wait a minute. There's a bit of a problem. There's a bit of an issue. How can they call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear if no one preaches or proclaims or witnesses to them? And we know uh, from the earlier lessons that that's the, that's the definition of evangelism. It's the spread of the Christian gospel by preaching and per, or personal witness. So, so he said, how, if no one evangelizes, if no one preaches, proclaims or witnesses to them, how can they hear? And finally, he asked the last question and wait, wait a minute, how can they preach or proclaim or witness if they haven't been sent? Well, I submit to you, uh, though the questions were rhetorical and rhetorical questions really don't need answers, I, uh, or, or they're just really meant to make us think, I submit that we have been sent because the command to go, which was given in what we call the Great Commission that's found in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, that uh, commission, that command was to the disciples who walked with Jesus physically during his time on earth, but it was also to those of us who walk with him by faith today. In fact, this scripture is the basis of our Zion mission statement, is it not? Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The Good News Translation makes it so clear and so easy to understand. Please listen to what it says. Matthew 28, 19, 20, it says, go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. See, 
plain, simple, right? And I hope you get the sense as I did that this is speaking specifically directly to you. And this isn't the only place in the Bible where we see disciples being sent. There are multiple places, but we're gonna look at just one more, which happens to be another one that's very close to us. It's Zion's uh, 2024 theme scripture, Acts 1.8. And if we stick with the Good News translation, we read, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Notice the common themes of going and of being a witness or telling others or proclaiming to others. The verse in Matthew speaks of going to people everywhere. And here in Acts, Jerusalem represents our immediate surroundings with Judea and Samaria referring to branching out to larger areas or larger spheres of influence. Anytime I've seen any, uh, uh, been in a courtroom, I've done a couple of jury duty stints, but anytime I've seen any witness in an actual courtroom or on television, uh, they were called upon, the witnesses were called upon to tell what they knew about a person or a situation. And our job as witnesses for Jesus Christ is simply to do the same, to give our testimony about what we know about Jesus and the difference that knowing him has made in the situations of our lives. We have but to understand and embrace and obey the assignment. And then further, we need to realize that there are some souls out there that are waiting just for us to come along and bring them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to be the link in the supply chain. We don't. We need to be the, the bridge um, that gets the product over, that gets the solution over from one end to the other. We want to be a part of the link that helped to, to connect us uh, to the body of Christ and to our brothers and sisters who have not yet come into the fold. In today's climate, it's entirely possible that you or I might be the first person to present Christ to someone, to the world. Or it could be that somebody has already planted a seed and we're needed to come along and give water to that seed or perhaps fertilizer to that seed or to perhaps stir the soil um, to help till it so that the ground doesn't become hard and more um, nutrients and fertilizer and things don't get in. It, in some way, in some way, we all have a part to play um, in the eventual call that the unbeliever will make and the salvation they will receive. Remember again, that evangelizing is just the public preaching or teaching about Jesus's sacrifice or our personal witness about it to others. It's simple, we go, then proclaim a witness to them. They hear the message and through the power of the Holy Spirit, they believe the message and call on Jesus to be their savior and their Lord. Somebody on the live stream tonight or somebody here in this recording later on might be thinking, if only it were that easy. Well, it really is. Well, at least our part really is that easy. Sometimes we make the mistake of, wit of thinking that witnessing or sharing Jesus mm -hmm. with someone means that we have to convince them or we have to persuade them, but we, we don't, we don't. Their response is not up to us. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And he's really, really good at it. He's really good at, at uh, uh, evoking or invoking the, the response that he knows that we should have. He's really good at changing hearts and regenerating us and making us alive uh, to the spirit of God. Um, and that's what Paul is referring to when he says that uh, in, in verse 17, um, when he says to him, but who, um, I'm sorry, verse 16, but not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our report? We don't know whether they're going to believe it or they're not. It's not our job. Um, somebody said in a in a old worldly saying that said, ours is not to wonder why, ours is but to do, um, and they said, or die. We are just um, commanded to go. We're commanded to go and to tell, uh, and the Holy Spirit will do the rest. He is the one, uh, one plants, another waters, but God is the one who gives the increase. 
we are just commanded to go. The Holy Spirit is responsible for the response. That's not up to us. We simply go and we tell them, realizing that the only way for them to receive the faith that's necessary for believing is by first hearing the message. And the message comes by the telling of the gospel, the good news, um, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, and we've been commissioned by him to do just that. Doesn't that sound familiar? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And verse 15 in the Good News Translation says, how wonderful is the coming of messengers who bring good news. Other translations, and we're real familiar with the King James, it says how beautiful are the feet of them that carry the gospel of good news. Others say how good, how fair, how timely. It's likened to Isaiah 52, 7, when the prophet was sent to proclaim the good news of the promise of Jerusalem's release from captivity. He was sent to tell them that their release from bondage, their captivity, Captivity to their enslavers, to those that held them uh, and made them pay taxes and work um, uh, inordinate, uh, in inordinate ways, all of those things, they were being released from captivity. It might help to spur us to action to think of our mission in a similar way of bringing the good news to others about their promise of freedom from the captivity or the bondage of sin. Someone might be waiting on you or me to tell them that whom the sun sets free is free indeed, and they can stand secure in the liberty wherewith Christ has made them free, and they need not be re-entangled with the bondage again. I've only seen one person get released from jail in my lifetime, so I can testify um, to what I've seen and heard, and I can tell you that it was a very, very joyful occasion for everyone who was there, for the one who was being released, as well as all of those who had come to greet that person. And I would imagine that any, um, almost anyone who is enjoying this new freedom would experience similar feelings of joy and exuberance. No wonder Paul said, how beautiful are the feet who carry the gospel of the good news. How wonderful, how timely. I think our, of our role as the one um, set to bring the good news of, of the release uh, to the one in captivity as, as, of, as being wonderful and good and fair and timely. Think about how that would seem to the prisoner. They would have to call it wonderful. So please consider that if you are looking at the problems of our world and you're saying something needs to be done, or you're repeating a phrase that I've heard from time to time and maybe even have said myself, this world needs Jesus. Then your spirit is already bearing witness with the word of God. And you have a realization of what it takes to make a difference for the better. It's going to take me and it's going to take you bringing Jesus to people. Someone is waiting to hear your personal, your individual, your unique story as only you can tell it. Somebody's waiting for you with your upbringing, your personality, your vocabulary, your charm, your wit, your education, your wisdom, your demeanor, your style, your quirks, your trials, your victories, your failures, your height, your weight, your nationality, your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your skin tone, your smile, your tears. Somebody's waiting for you. So please listen to how our focus scriptures read in the message translation. Romans 10, um, four to 17, he says, uh, four, I'm sorry, 14 to 17, he says, but how can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? And how can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it? That's why scripture exclaims, a sight to take your breath away. Grand processions of people telling all the good things of God. But not everybody is ready for this, ready to see and hear and act. Isaiah asked what we all ask at one time or another. Does anybody care, God? Is anyone listening and believing a word of it? The point is, before you trust, you have to listen. But unless Christ's word is preached, there's nothing to listen to. 
So when the question is put to us, as it was to Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? I pray we'll each respond as Isaiah did. Here am I, send me the word of the Lord for this evening. Thanks be to God. Amen. Sister Tracy Lynn, Minister Tracy Lynn. Amen. Thank you so much for that word. That really touched my heart, my soul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what God has sent through you um, tonight for this word. Um, we're going to um, close in prayer. Um, just we're going to close in prayer. Oh, merciful God. Thank you for the word that you have given your servant for us, preparing this table for us to feast on your word tonight. Lord, let it be richly planted in our hearts, oh God, as we are thankful that you have fearfully and wonderfully made us and, and someone is waiting for us just as we are. Thank you, Lord. Strengthen us and give us the courage as we go out and evangelize, telling the world about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Bless Reverend Moore as she has given this word. Refresh her, refill her, and bless her in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you're muted, by the way. Thank you're, you. You're very welcome. God bless you, everybody. Have a good night. Yes, good night. Thank you, Reverend Moore. Thank you for that word. Yes. The word. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Reverend Moore. Very encouraging. Thank you for the word. Praise God. God bless you, everybody. God bless. God bless, Minister Tracy. Thank you. And everyone, good night. Good night. Good night. And um, we'll be back here um, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., and um, just as you may have heard the announcement earlier today, as we're in day 17 of our fast that is ending on October 12th, our corporate fast is ending on October 12th, and that's the same day as the SBA Jazz Brunch. So to support the SBA, the fast will still end on October 12th, but those attending the Jazz Brunch that same day can end their fast at 11 a.m. instead of 6.30 p.m. So you'll hear more about that on Sunday, but we will see you at 8 a.m. And thank you again, Reverend Barbara Moore, for that timely, uh, spirit-filled, wonderful word from the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. Can I just add one quick announcement? Um, mm -hmm. about Writer Day Brief Ministry is not meeting mm -hmm. on Saturday because we have the active shooter training um, that's taking place at 10 a.m. So um, no Writer Day Ministry, uh, none online and none in person. Right. Okay. There, there will be a reminder that goes out tomorrow. John's going to send the newsletter, the email blast, and that is in the email blast. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm.